I love abstract art. By subtracting the detail that makes up more realistic, figurative art, abstract art can provoke a greater variety of emotions and interpretations. Take a look at this. What is this piece trying to represent? Why these colors? Why that particular brushstroke technique? Does the author have a definitive interpretation? Or was it made unconsciously? In order to fill in those gaps, you need to rely solely on your intuition. If you combine a quality piece of abstract art with a perceptive viewer, your intuition may give you a transcendental experience. Though I love abstraction and minimalism, it bears a particular challenge when it comes to the artistic medium of video games. That being the fact that the audience's need for entertainment generally supersedes any desire for an interpretive experience. This is why game series like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto are so popular. They are not abstract art. They try to simulate real-life combat in order to provide the greatest thrill, as if you were there yourself. To make them abstract or minimalist would mean taking away the things that make them entertaining. That said, there have been successful inclusions of abstract technique in games, even if they are in the comparative minority and aren't as financially successful. But often, the ones that do it are celebrated as the greatest games of all time. The examples that gamers often point to when showing video games can be high art. but. What game enabled this trend? When did games make this turn from being a medium predominantly about entertainment and simulation to one that could provide transcendental meditation through abstract technique? While the importance of games like Myst or Silent Hill cannot be understated in this regard, there is one game, more than any other, that is cited by the creators of various gaming masterpieces as an influence. That game is Ico. In every- Yeah, yeah, yes I know it's pronounced Ico, I was just trying to trigger the people who have made my pronunciation of certain words a life or death issue for almost a decade in every aspect of its game design. Ico embraces abstraction, or as the game's director, Fumito Ueda likes to refer to it, design by subtraction. Unless there was something in the game that was absolutely necessary for it to function, it was removed. This means that the game features barely any music, any dialogue, any characters, very few points of interest in the game's world. The combat is boiled down to just hitting the square button a number of times, and the puzzles are generally very easy to figure out. But like with any great abstract artist, they will use ingenious art direction to make do with what little they have. And that's what Ueda did with Ico. Where most games will focus on moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that keeps their audience engaged, Ico surgically removes any trace of that common design philosophy and revels in its absence. It is with the lack of things going on that Ico invites its audience to try and fill in the gaps themselves. With the lack of characters or dialogue, you find yourself developing a deep emotional bond with the one character that accompanies you. With the lack of any points of interest in the game's world, you are driven to treasure the moments when you do see something truly unique. With the lack of music, you often have to decide for yourself how a particular part of a game makes you feel. All of these elements and more combine to create an experience that is both indescribable and irreplicable as a whole. Though, as I said before, there have been a number of other masterpieces whose designers have borrowed from Eco's technique. Today, I want to analyze Eco's unique approach to game design and demonstrate how its DNA can be found in innumerable games that followed after. Best of all, I will do so without spoiling anything about the story, because, well, there's barely anything to spoil outside of the ending. Before I get to that, I will kindly ask that if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and maybe consider subscribing. That helps me out a lot. Now, let's begin with a synopsis for those who know nothing about Eco. The game begins with three men traveling through the woods on horseback. They have been tasked with transporting the titular Eco, a boy born with horns, to a massive, mysterious castle. Upon their arrival, they enter a chamber filled with glowing sarcophagi. 
The three men place Eco into one of these sarcophagi, and as it closes, one of them says, Do not be angry with us. This is for the good of the village. Luckily for Eco, the foundation under his sarcophagus conveniently breaks. Ooh, how convenient! Allowing Eco to tumble out. He intends to escape the castle, obviously, but right when he's about to begin his long journey, he encounters a young girl named Yorda, who is imprisoned in a cage dangling at the top of a long spiral staircase. After Iko frees Yorda, he explains his situation to her, revealing that boys with horns are brought there to be sacrificed. Unfortunately, he is unable to learn anything about Yorda because she speaks a completely different language to him. Nonetheless, he is able to discern that they both share the same desire to escape. Thus, they begin their long journey out of the castle. And this comprises the majority of the game's story. Outside of a couple of meetings with the game's villain and a reveal towards the end regarding why Yorda was imprisoned, there is very little surface level narrative. I should also note that with the scenes we do get, there is almost no dialogue. In total, I counted 43 subtitle cards with 49 sentences of dialogue and six of those sentences we can't even understand, because it's Yorda speaking a different language. Now some who have never played Eco might hear that and suspect that maybe the majority of the storytelling is done visually, similar to a game like Limbo. Though that's partially true, it's mostly not. Most of the game is just Eco and Yorda traveling through the castle with maybe three or four sites within that might give extra context to the story. But even those are hard to discern unless you're hardcore into the lore. Now when you combine this with single button pushing combat and very straightforward puzzles, it becomes difficult for newcomers to Eco to understand what the appeal is. Hell, it was difficult for people who played it to convey its majesty. Reviewers couldn't find the right words, and the marketers couldn't create box art to convey what the game was all about. Though I still feel they could have done something other than give Eco the Elvis lip. Oh. All this said, there is one very insightful and descriptive comment that really helps summarize Eco's uniqueness. It comes from the lead writer for the legendary Half-Life series, Mark Laidlaw. In an interview with Gama Sutra, he noted that games are, quote, often rigidly structured. They usually follow the same framework where you go through a period of frustration and challenge and then feel relief upon completion. He personally wishes that games would try to go beyond that framework more often and include moments of elation and insight throughout, not necessarily just following the completion of a challenge. Of the few games that do break that mold, the one that Mark felt did it best was Eco, where he felt, quote, the narrative structure, the gameplay, and the emotional impact were all seamlessly fused into one. Anybody who has played Eco will know how much this statement nails the game's spirit on the head. The game subtracts from that traditional marriage of gameplay and narrative, where the challenges and the subsequent climaxes are clearly defined. Instead, the experience is pretty close to what happens when one looks at an abstract painting. The audience must create their own climaxes, their own meaning. This in turn allows the gamer to immerse themselves more deeply in the world around them, develop a greater appreciation for what is there, and an even greater appreciation when something truly novel appears. Let's look at a few examples of how the game makes so much of so little, and how that design philosophy carried into other games. A large amount of the time, you will be in an enclosed environment surrounded by architecture that is mostly devoid of any meaningful detail, and barely any life within it, save for the occasional bird. Every 15 to 30 minutes, however, you will enter a new area and see something that stands out, and that previous lacking will make you want to extract as much beauty and meaning as you can from that new element. Sometimes, this thing can be as simple as a patch of greenery and trees inside the mostly lifeless and drab walls of the castle. Other times, it might be what looks like a graveyard, making the gamer speculate on who could possibly occupy those graves. 
The most awe-inspiring moments, I believe, are the numerous moments when you exit an enclosed space into the open air, where the castle walls extend high above you and heavy gusts of wind deafen your ears. Now, it's not uncommon for fantasy games to feature large and beautiful looking castles, but you're often not able to appreciate them fully because you're either trying to seek out or complete a quest or you're fighting a battle. But with Eco, every time you are outside and you see the unconscionably large size of the castle, you feel the same way, I imagine, that a mouse does when it sees a lion. Except, you know, minus the knowledge of its impending demise. Eco is littered with these types of moments, and like Mark Laidlaw said, they are not presented in a traditional way. There's usually not a musical cue to tell you that you should feel awe, or that the thing you're looking at is of any significance. It is up to you to involve yourself in what's going on and derive that meaning for yourself. The most important source of meaning, in my opinion, lies with Yorda. Now one way that you could describe Eco to a newcomer is that it is one long escort quest. Though true from a certain point of view, trying to market the game that way would make more gamers run for the hills than if they heard Sonic 06 was getting a remake. And no, I don't want to hear if you would personally be down for that, thank you very much. But unlike escort quests in other games, where you're looking to be rid of the brainless NPC as soon as possible, Yorda is all you have. Without her, you would be completely alone and isolated. So naturally, you cannot help but want to protect her. This bond is strengthened by the enemy encounters. Sometimes, you will need to separate from Yorda, usually when you're completing a puzzle. Every time you do this, there is a deep sense of anxiety that in your absence, the shadow creatures will come and take her away, which does tend to happen. You can fight them back the majority of the time, but due to your limited combat ability, there's always a decent chance that unless you're on your game, you could lose Yorda. Plus, unlike with most games where a failed combat encounter would result in the death of the character you control, the figurative death in Eco occurs when a shadow creature successfully kidnaps Yorda. Thus, your primary concern is never your life, but hers. And if you manage to protect her, her presence will continue to quell those feelings of loneliness and isolation, and amplify those moments of awe and wonder, because you have somebody to share it with. Now while this relationship between Eco and Yorda mostly succeeds, it is still a game from 2001, and suffers from some technical limitations. Often, Yorda will think it's a great idea for some reason to stand over the black hole that the shadows are trying to drag her into. Sometimes she'll spin in place like she's trying and failing to do a box step waltz. God, just looking at this is giving me some PTSD. Yorda! Yorda! What are you doing? Y Yorda! <sighs> McFly! Hello? Anybody home? These technical problems, however, were the impetus for other masterful game designers to take the things that worked from Eco and improve upon them in their games. One of the best examples, I think, of a combination of isolation and a soul companion is with the game Journey, the creators of which cite Eco as their primary inspiration. In that game, you will often encounter sparse landscapes with few points of interest. However, as you play, you will randomly meet other players, who, like Yorda, also speak a foreign language. Aside from that prime example, there are a litany of other games that use this minimalist approach in their game design and cite Eco as an inspiration. Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, one of my top 5 favorite games of all time, follows the titular prince and his companion Farah as they also try to escape a castle. The Last of Us follows Joel and Ellie, who often find themselves on their own trying to survive. Halo 4 builds on the relationship between Master Chief and Cortana, particularly on the anxiety that Chief might lose Cortana any second, which is somewhat similar to the anxiety that some gamers might feel when they might lose Yorda. There's Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, which was made by Joseph Fares, who was clearly so inspired by the dichotomy of Eco and Yorda that he made that game and all of his subsequent games about an emotional journey between two protagonists. 
All these games use pervasive isolation to strengthen the main character's bond with their companion, and did it so well that they all went on to be nominated, and often win, various Game of the Year awards. Though of course, many of these games received their accolades for a variety of reasons, they wouldn't have the heart they did without those elements of companionship and isolation, and they wouldn't have been as strong if Eco didn't light the way. I would be remiss though if I did not mention the one game creator that Eco clearly had the largest impact on, the one that might be the greatest game director in the world right now, that of course being Hidetaka Miyazaki, famous for directing Elden Ring, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and of course the Dark Souls series, which in turn gave birth to the entire Souls-like subgenre. According to Miyazaki, he changed his entire career path because of Eco because it showed him just what video games were capable of artistically if you took a minimalist approach. The clearest example of this is his tendency to forego all forms of traditional narrative design and world building. Like with Eco, Miyazaki's games almost always plop you into the middle of a mysterious world with a long forgotten history. You can attempt to unravel that history by looking at a building's architecture, the unique placement of a statue, or interpreting item descriptions, but the likelihood that you will get a full picture of what is going on is very unlikely. But that's the beauty of it. Like I said before about abstract art, the lack of clarity provokes the audience to make their own interpretations, and reveling in those infinite number of interpretations is a large part of what makes Miyazaki's games so magical. But we wouldn't have been able to enjoy the perfection of this type of storytelling, nay the perfection of Miyazaki's games in general, if Ico didn't do the heavy lifting. There are numerous other smaller ways that the game has influenced modern game design. The dreamlike color scheme and lighting of Eco heavily influenced the art design of games like Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, but also games like The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess and even Metal Gear Solid 3. Any game that has companion mechanics, games like Bioshock Infinite with Booker and Elizabeth, that game was also inspired by Eco. Even beloved indie titles like Papo and Gio and Fez, the list goes on and on and on. Though one could argue, and even I would argue, that there are games that were overall more important to the evolution of the video game medium, few if any were as unique as Eco, and few if any demonstrated just what the video game medium could do as an interpretive art form. Now, for the love of God, can somebody throw a big wad of cash at Fumeda Oeda's door and help him finish his fourth game before I go through Shadow of the Colossus another hundred times? Please? Thank you very much for watching, guys. Remember to hit that like button if you like this video, and make sure to sound off in the comments if you have any thoughts on Eco or my analysis. I especially want to hear from the people who have played Eco and the unique effect that the game had on them. Finally, if you want to see more about Fumeto Ueda's games, like Shadow of the Colossus or The Last Guardian, make sure to click on any of the videos you see on screen now. Until next time, I want to remind you as always and as per usual, stay yellow.